will join and um, like you know we have interpretation um, for this webinar series so if you're a French speaker you need to look at uh, the tabs on your zoom and you will see the globe icon when you see the globe icon click on English which is the main uh, language and then if you are an English speaker if you're a French speaker, then you click on French and then you hear the interpretation uh, directly uh, on in French. And I would like to say good morning to all our speakers. Thank you for joining this morning. Thank you for coming out to come and share with us uh, from your experience. We are very happy that you are here. This is the fifth webinar. Wow. Um, that's <laughs> it's a long time that we have spent together in this series, and uh, we are glad that uh, gradually it's coming to an end. This uh, week, uh, we are looking at how PGS groups organize uh, for market and integrity of production. So we're trying to figure, I'm um, trying to look at how the market is being pulled together. How do those PGS groups, how do they start forming market? And we're going to have diverse experience from across Africa, which is very interesting to see and to know. And then how integrity of the production system is maintained, because that's the key. If we look at the fundamentals of PGS, we look at the, the element of trust. How are we maintaining this trust? We're going to hear from all our panelists today and how they have been looking and maintaining the integrity of production and making sure that it is consistent. So to start with this morning, uh, we're going to uh, invite uh, Henry and uh, who will be speaking to us from the South African experience. She's going to introduce uh, um, herself with a colleague. So Henry, uh, please feel free to introduce yourself and please uh, share your slide and also please everyone uh, as you're joining kindly introduce yourself in the chat uh, where you come from and uh, your country where you come from and who you are so that we can have a flow of everybody thank you so much and i hope that everyone will enjoy this session thank you over to you Andre. hi um okay my, my name is audrey actually <laughs> audrey wainwright <laughs> But that's fine. I'm quite open to different interpretations. It's just a name. <laughs> um, uh, so my name is Audrey Wainwright. I've been working in PGS for 10 years, mm -hmm. first at the Bryanston Organic Market. Then I was really lucky enough to attend the IFOM um, Organic Leadership course, which was really where I learned to understand PGS and also its relevance worldwide. Um, and now I'm working at the Ranyazuk City Farm Market in Cape Town, um, but being involved in PGS here and with PGS South Africa as well. Um, I sit on the iPhone PGS committee um, and also serve on the South African Bureau of Standards um, Organic Technical Committee for Organic Production and Processing. So those are two areas that give me some other insights into the work besides the local work that I do. Um, so Cheryl, uh, uh, Cheryl and I work together at the Ron Isaac Market, and she's going to start with her presentation, and she'll introduce herself now. Thanks, uh, Audrey, and thank you. Good morning, everybody. We're coming to you live from Cape Town, where it's a very, very sunny, beautiful day, as opposed to the three months of rain that we've had. And obviously, working at the Ron Isaac Market, we feel the pain when it's raining. So when it's sunny, we're happy. So ladies and gentlemen, good morning. I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself and then I'm going to go into my presentation and then I'm going to hand over to Audrey afterwards. I actually qualified as a marine biologist a long time ago. You can see the gray hairs and I worked to develop museums and aquariums here in Cape Town and then a short while ago I had a terrible experience at home where I was attacked by a man with a gun and that set in motion a whole range of interesting questions that I started asking. Who looks after our community? Who works with the police? And the answer was no one really looks after the safety of our community. So together with others, I helped to start a neighborhood watch and we made our community safer. But I realized one thing that safety alone doesn't build community. 
And I wanted people to come out from their homes and meet each other and talk. Because if you can talk to each other, you can create whatever you want. Everything is possible. And we realized that one thing that brought people together was food. So we found a neglected bowling green, lawn bowling in our area. And when we did some research, we found that it was once a farm called Aranyazukt that the Dutch had farmed when they were growing the Cape Colony in order to supply the passing ships that were going from Europe to the East to get spices. And we converted that farm into a most magnificent community farm. Yeah, you're going to see it now in the slides on the slopes of Table Mountain. And people started coming and talking about food, how their food was grown, kids and adults. And we then realized that we needed some money in order to keep the farm going. So what we did was we started a small little market right next door to the farm. And even though we didn't have a lot of produce, we asked some farmers if they would come and sell produce that they grew at our market. And guess what the answer was? The answer was, Cheryl, we're too busy to come. We can't really come and stand at your market for a full day. We don't have the time. We're busy on our farms. And we understood that. And they also said that they had so little to sell because these were micro, small, organic farmers, especially in the winter months when it rains heavily in Cape Town and large parts of the Cape Flats where the vegetables grow are flooded. And so they said it wouldn't be viable for them to bring such small quantities of produce to a market because the transport alone would cost more than what they would make selling their vegetables. So we decided to take the risk upon ourselves because we wanted to give consumers the opportunity to enjoy good, fresh, organically produced food. And we wanted to change the food system that is broken in some small way. So we said to the farmers, we will buy everything that you can produce and we'll start aggregating. So if we need a hundred bunches of carrots to sell on a weekend at the market and you can only produce five or 10, then we'll buy five from you, 10 from you, 20 from you. And so we will be able to build up and have enough produce to sell at the market every weekend. So we took the risk on ourselves. The farmers were paid for what they produced and we aggregated and we then started to build the quantities so that we had enough to sell every weekend. And in a way, 10 years ago, when we started the market and the farm in Aranyazuk, the community farm, we already created an informal, unofficial family of organic farmers and started working closely with them long before we even started a PGS group, because we only started our PGS group three years ago. But already 10 years ago, we were working with farmers. When they would deliver, we would talk to them about the farming challenges, how we could help them, about how they could create better quality, what they could grow, production planning, so that we would have enough produce each week and different produce from each of the farmers. And we also started visiting their farms. And Therefore, it was a natural progression for us three years ago to create, with Audrey's help, a PGS group for our market. And this way, we could also share the love amongst the farmers. So instead of buying from one farmer, we started buying from 35 farmers. And each farmer, every week, would get some love from us and some money so that they could buy seeds and support grow more crops for us and of course support their families and it was also a very important point for us to have as much variety as possible so that we could stock produce that wasn't freely available in the supermarkets in Cape Town and in South Africa we have a huge amount of supermarkets and massive big shopping centers and the problem with that is that around these shopping centers you have fast food outlets and people are buying food that is bad for them, that is not full of nutrition, that is not healthy. It's making them obese and it's making them ill. And we wanted to change that by giving consumers the option to buy healthy food. 
So it was important for us to have multicolored carrots and heirloom tomatoes and shushu and horseradish and asparagus because we have a market here in the VNA waterfront. It's a very affluent area and people, lucky for us, and I suppose lucky for them, they can afford to buy the best of the best. And if we're going to compete with the likes of all the big supermarket chains, we need to get what nobody else has got. For example, I want to show you today, we have this beautiful Avo from a farm just near George, near the Great Brack River. It's called a Maluma Avo, not a Malema Avo, a Maluma Avo. It's a harsh variety, but it's incredibly nutty and creamy and buttery. And it's the best Avo we've ever, ever tasted. So no one else has got these Avos. Audrey, and I'm so proud to be able to sell them. We learned over the years also how to display produce. You can see the displays are so beautiful so that they're eye-catching, they're colorful, they're engaging with consumers. And we also began to realize that we had to educate the consumer. The consumer didn't know anything about PGS, didn't know anything about organic. And we used our skills in social media and to tell the story, the story of organic farmers, the highs and the lows, issues around pest control and issues around land and how they battle to find land, climate change. And slowly but surely, we built up a customer base of loyal customers who really loved the story and they wanted to support the market. And then we also began to realize that some of our farmers were aggregating. So if they were bringing produce to us from Malmesbury and they didn't have enough, they were buying from other farms. And we thought that that was a good thing because it would make the trip viable. But then we also shared with them the need for those farms that they were aggregating from to be PGS certified. And in that way, we spread our net and we started getting more and more farms and farmers coming to us to say that they wanted to be certified under the PGS banner. Now, our, our original vision at the Aranyazak City Farm, which was a nonprofit, by the way, and in 2017, we converted the market to a for-profit company, but our original vision in the nonprofit, which still exists and still farms and is under a trust, was to convert many bowling greens into a bowl of greens, to literally create urban community farms all over South Africa and especially the Western Cape. But we realized that we could do more for farmers by establishing farmers markets around the country. And then we would be the pool, the demand, the catalyst, to buy from these organic farmers. And if we could buy from them every week, more people would want to farm. And not only to create farmers markets, but to create all kinds of retail platforms that farmers themselves could control. Farmers markets being one example, so that we could con take control of our food system and create food democracy. So food markets, food clubs, community supported, supported agriculture, CSA programs, any method to create opportunities for farmers to sell their own vegetables and to take more control of the food system. We also realized that we had to sell conventional produce as well because many customers came to us and said, well, I can't get garlic here and I can't get ginger here and I can't get fennel here or I can't get what I'm looking for. So we started to realize that we needed to sell the full spectrum. And I think we sell about 120 different varieties of vegetables now. I would say about 65 to 70%, depending on the season is organic. The rest is conventional. We market as conventional and people know that it is conventional, but at least they can get it here. Our thinking there was that it was better to sell what they needed. Otherwise we would have lost the customer to another supermarket or to a supermarket chain and they wouldn't come back and then slowly work with our farmers to begin to produce those varieties of vegetables that were currently not produced organically. So this slide really talks to the relationship between farmers and farmers markets and Audrey is going to expand on that but essentially farmers 
are critical to a successful farmer's market. If you don't have farmers, even if you're buying the produce from them and displaying it yourself, if you don't have a trusted relationship, then you're not going to have a successful farmer's market. So it's about a foundation that is built on mutual support and collaboration. It's really the bridge that connects agriculture to the local community. You foster a sense of food security and sustainability. And it's that personal connection between farmers and they are the people who grow our food and the people who enjoy eating it. And it stimulates local economies. It, uh, the money stays in the neighborhood where it is spent as opposed to going into a supermarket chain where the profits are sent offshore to shareholders. And more than that, what this PGS certification group does is that it is a platform for continuous learning. So once you form a PGS group, the farmers come, they deliver, you have meetings, and at the end of the day, it facilitates continuous learning. There are workshops, there are online um, programs and modules, there are all kinds of lessons and learnings that the farmers experience through the PGS group. We've just had a nine module online course that uh, we developed on how to establish a farmer's market. And if any of you want to enjoy those presentations, they are online. You can ask um, the organic sector organization for those particular links later. So we also realized that we started, we needed to start working with our farmers in terms of production planning so that we would have enough produce year round and that not all the farmers that we were buying from, from would produce the same varieties and cultivars. So we started to look at how we could meet market demand, how we could production plan with our farmers, at what prices they could sell so that they could have high enough margins to make a profit, but that we also could make a profit when we sold their produce here at the market. So meeting market demand was important, maximizing sales were important, and also production planning is, is really about soil health. So we worked very hard with our farmers in terms of how they could improve the health of their soil. Then moving on, we also realized the importance of customer education because that drives demand for PGS certification. So if you want your PGS group to do well, you've got to be able to sell the produce that the farmers are creating and producing, and that's got to grow. So it's about awareness. They don't understand PGS. How do you create awareness? You have all kinds of awareness days. I think that Audrey was on World Organic Day, September the 22nd, where we put up posters. We had our farmers here. We had a lovely competition where if you could identify all those crops on the slide in the middle top, then you would win prizes. We talked about the standards. We talked about product differentiation, that PGS products, they are set apart from conventional product that is sold by our competitors. Tastier, more nutritious, more delicious. We talked about trust and credibility, that customer education, if they understand the rigorous standards and the, the verification process involved in PGS certification, they start building trust with the farmer's market and with the people who are selling the produce. And then also just new kinds of heirloom vegetables like here and buonkis and sour figs and rooibos tea and how it's produced by organic farmers builds an incredible loyalty amongst your customer base. Consumer confidence, very important that they begin to trust uh, the verification process and they begin to learn about the origin and quality, and that leads to increased demand. Marketing and promotion, telling the stories of the farmers. If you go onto our Instagram feed, OZC Farm, you will see that we are continually telling stories of our farmers, and people really love that because somehow or another, traditional news media don't report well on agriculture, and they don't tell the stories, the positive stories. And, and the trials and tribulations of farmers. Here you can see we're taking down names 
for the next farm visits so that we can invite consumers to farm visits. And they become advocates for PGS organic certification. Those consumers, word of mouth, tell their friends. And soon, before you know it, you've got 12,000 people coming to a market like ours on the weekend. So here you can see World Organic Day. We even had a quiz that's farmer Roger Isaacs, who farms at a school in Athlone. And there you can see we had a World Organic Day from its roots, organic inspires life, shade that, shake the hand that feeds you with all kinds of questions that customers could answer and win prizes. Engaging customers, very, very important. So to end off, before I hand over to Audrey, I thought I'd end off with a quote by Vandana Shiva. I'm sure many of you in Ghana know who she is an Indian food activist, we must occupy the food system to create food democracy. What Shiva is expressing is a call to action for people to take back control and participate in the food system themselves. Food democracy really referring to a vision where people, especially consumers and small scale farmers, like many of you, have an active and meaningful say in how the food system operates. It emphasizes the importance of ensuring that decisions about food production, distribution, and access are equitable, inclusive, and environmentally sustainable. And we encourage you all to start thinking about how you can take more control over your food system in your neighborhood. And Audrey is now going to occupy the space. <laughs> <laughs> Never mind food democracy, and give you the tools. What are the tools that you as farmers can use in order to occupy the food space in your neighborhood? Thank you very much. I look forward to questions at the end. Audrey. Great. Thank you, Cheryl. So she uses the word occupy. And you know, I think that there's so much talking. There's just talking all the time until your head is full of things that confuse you and blur the truth. And when she used that word occupy, I thought, okay, the way to do it is to take the tools that PGS gives you and use them. And they're all there in the six basic elements and the 10 key features. So I'm just gonna go through briefly PGS South Africa's tools. They have, um, over the years, and I think for the past, since about 2005, developed a range of guidelines and, and documents to, that PGS groups can use. So the first one is the basic production principles. This is um, articulated, it's the standard that's been articulated in a simple, straightforward way. Um, it's based on a recognized standard. In our case, it's the Soorso standard. Mm -hmm. um, other groups like the Demeter PGS will use the Demeter standard, and groups can also create their own standards, but it needs to be internationally recognized. Then the standard operating procedures, the SOP, those are the rules of the group. And those rules, there's a guide, there's a there's a template for you for, as a suggestion, but those rules are taken by the by the group. And the group says, yeah, we're comfortable with that. Or actually, you know what? We want to do visits every six months. Or if somebody breaks the rule, we want to do something different because the, the, those rules also include co consequences for non-compliance and things like that. Then you, we've got the um, farm assessment documents. So you've got a farm questionnaire. You've got checklists for participants on the farm visits. Um, you develop a report from the questionnaire after the farm visits. You issue certificates, and on those certificates are the logos. So you can see here in South Africa, we've got the PGS organic one with the, the group's name would be underneath it so that consumers can identify and there's traceability. And you can see just underneath there, it says PGS code. So that's something that will be perhaps taken on by Matt later on in the, these presentations. And there's an organic one and an organic in conversion. And then PGS South Africa, because they need to look after the integrity of all of the PGS groups in the country, they also have reporting templates where the, the groups can um, report to PGS South Africa. And if PGS South Africa then see from those reports that a group needs some guidance or some support, then they, they can respond um, effectively to that. So 
I just wanted to point out that it's all there, though, these tools for your traceability and for your integrity of your PGS system are all in the six basic elements and the 10 key features. So this slide shows the 10 key features. The first four are the enabling features, grassroots organizations supporting smallholder agriculture, principles that, that enhance the, the life of the communities that are, are practicing, um, and then also ways to support farmers, whether it's access to water or those are all enabling um, mechanisms. Then the next six, these, these are your tools. So your norms are your standard. So you, what is our norm? It's our standard. And that they're adopted or created by the stakeholders, which are your PGS farmers and members and consumers. There are documented management systems and procedures. So that's your standard operating procedure. How are we going to work? What is our procedure? There are me mechanisms to verify com farmers' compliance. That is your questionnaire, your checklist, your, your farm visit um, documentation. Clear and previously defined consequences. Those are when somebody breaks one of the, the rules of your, because you, you sign a pledge. If you break a rule, what is going to happen? People know, need to know that up front. Um, then the, the next one, sorry, I've just lost my slide there. Um, the farmer's pledge, um, it can be part of the SOPs, but it doesn't have to be. It can also be like we did some training out where, where Matt is near Aikenhook and um, we were doing training and I asked the farmers to come up with their own pledge and that they could use a song or a dance or a work of art or anything that, that they wanted to and they they created this song in like 15 minutes and with movement and dancing and that was their pledge and their commitment so remember not to box in your head around when you look at these key features but they are incredibly helpful because they give you all the tools that you need to occupy the pgs space and then your seals and labels so that consumers can recognize um, who you are and what you what you mean um, one of the big problems that we have, and I think it's worldwide, but definitely in South Africa, is record keeping. So that's also it's so important with traceability. Like, you know, we, we're not a third party audit system. We don't like add up all the seeds bought, how many planted, add up the, the, the one, the, the harvesting and do a full financial audit on every single farm. We're using the six, um, the six basic elements to build the resilience and the integrity of our system. But with, it, with regards to the planting and harvesting, if there is a complaint, we need to be able to go back to the farmer and say, let's look and where, where did this complaint come from? Um, what, what happened in your process? So one of the most important things to do is to have a production plan because from your production plan where you've got your whole year there, January, February to December, and then you decide what you're going to plant, you could take into account crop rotation. Okay, I'll do the peas over there. If I plant in that bed, this many peas, I should get about that much harvest. And then I'm going to rotate the bed. After that, I'm going to put it in a heavy feeder. And then on the side of it, you can then record because weather and climate and pests will change your perhaps your harvest harvesting and then you record what you've harvested so I think that this area needs is for a traceability it's an area that we need to to really work on um here's a farmer Shadrick from brilliant farmer from Gauteng and he uses a diary so everything he writes in his diary that he put petrol in his car that he had to go and get a new exhaust that he went and collected vegetables from somebody else because their car broke down so and then his planting and his harvesting record. So he has an entire diary of his life. If you want to interrogate and see why or what or where, you can go to his diary and find the answers. Then in the middle, you know, in there is incredible skills in this country, um, the indigenous knowledge, the traditional farming that there is all over Africa that has just been so sidelined by big agri. Um, the, the skills and the abilities there are incredible, but some of those farmers might not have the writing and the, the the literacy skills to be able to do all of this planning and and record keeping in writing so we're looking at um farm mapping and there are a couple of places we haven't um explored it very deeply but there are a couple of people in south africa that really are using mat maps very effectively and um, you can for your farm visit inspection or your assessment you can show the exact layout of your farm and what you're growing you can put an arrow you can draw pictures of what you're growing and obviously maybe still need somebody to be able to communicate um, within the pgs group the reporting to pgs south africa 
And then the last picture I just wanted to show you, that was a, a, a visit to Velotta Farm in Philippi that we did two weeks ago. And also, you know, just to, showing the pen and the and the and the soil and the compost. So important that there, there is this um, physical relationship between the farmer and consumers and other farmers. So that's what that represents. But record keeping, very important. Um, then I want to go on to traceability in terms of the aggregation. Cheryl spoke a little bit about that. So the picture there of everybody smiling, um, that is Lentech here. It is a, a mental hospital for promoting mental health for people who have had some challenges in their life. Um, the, the focus, there was a, a, somebody who started it understanding that the serotonin that comes from when you're working in soil is really good for your mental health. But the government, um, they've got a, the, the hospital is owned by the government and they've got a tender process where if you, to the, all the food that, that goes to supply the hospital um, comes from, out, is outsourced from a, um, with a tender. So the, the, farm, the, the farm activities that the patients also work, um, where, where they work, they can't sell that food to their own hospital. So they, they need markets. So that's like one of the challenges of that particular farm. And then in order to make a, a, a good, decent business of it, I mean, the margin for carrots is so tiny. You need to be able to offer your markets a variety and a, and a, and a certain quantity. You can't just bring like three and a half bunches of carrots. You need to have 15 bunches of carrots to offer. So a lot of the smallholder farmers that we support have got small pieces of land. So we found many people were starting to aggregate and buy from local farmers that they believed and trusted because they looked those farmers in the eye and said, okay, no, we're farming organically. We don't use any chemicals. So they were buying produce from those farmers and then supplying the market under one name. And when we did our visit there, we realized, no, this is a brilliant opportunity to introduce PGS to those supplying farmers who are also aggregating. So, you know, it's a very long process to start PGS. It takes some years, firstly, for groups to, to be created and settle and, and understand like all of the aspects and principles that support their integrity, but also for, for to, to get farmers to understand what organic agriculture is. It's not a, just about no chemicals and pesticides. It's about social justice. It's about crop rotation. It's about soil health, millions of things. So it is complex. And that does take time when you're pulling in new farmers into the group. So we have tried and we, it is a little bit slow. We're not on top of it. It is around capacity. Always it's around capacity and finding the finances to maybe um, send a team out to five different farms to do an initial first visit to see if those farmers are ready for market. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think that that the the challenge there is is being able to get those farms PGS certified and then ensuring that the invoicing system reflects that the, the, these this product is from Lentechia. These products are from the, the neighboring farm, also with the PGS confirmation. Um, I want to just talk, go back now a little bit to markets. So, you know, when you've got farmers who are part of a PGS group or not, when they're going to market themselves and they're going to sell to customers, um, they can call themselves organic. They can say, my vegetables here on this table are grown organically. The customer has the right to choose to trust that farmer or not. The customer is right there. There's no second or third party in between. And every individual farmer and every individual consumer has the right to be able to say, this is organic and I accept that this is organic and I'm buying it. Second party, which is PGS, comes in when there is a farmer and there is the consumer and there is a market in between. So that gives the market an incredibly important and, and quite precious role because the market is, needs to make the connection between the farmer and the consumer with stories, and Cheryl spoke about the stories earlier, and then the seals, the seals or the logos that identify that that farm has had its assessment. Um, yeah, the consumers of the pool, remember, Cheryl also mentioned that, is that you, you need farmers with surplus and you need consumers demanding organic produce. So I just want to speak to you about the importance of, of stories in traceability, because you're educating at market, you're educating consumers all the time. 
So we have a, a, a farmer supplying us um, with free range eggs. Now, this is a part of a PGS group called Overberg PGS. Um, they decided because there is an independence of PGS groups where they define their journey and their route and what they want to do. And they decided they needed some kind of identification for their free range eggs, because in South Africa, you can't find certified organic feed. And if you want to find GMO free, GMO free um, um, animal feed, you have to import it from you have to import it from Zambia. So, so they couldn't call it organic, although all the other aspects of this farm were. Um, and when customers come and they say, oh, like what, you know, which eggs should I buy? And what does this mean? I show them the logo and I explain it, what participatory guarantees those systems are. I speak about how, what they're based on, that they're based on trust and transparency, that the farmers work together on the farms and they share knowledge when they go on and, and visit each other's farms, that there is a shared vision amongst the group. I, you cannot believe how inspired customers are to hear that there is something more than just some arbitrary piece of paper with some signature and a list. Like who believes anything that comes your way anymore? But here is something that when you tell a customer that this is based on something that you as a person feel inside, it changes. And, you know, most people actually want to do good and they're looking for opportunities. So the customers really do engage in this. I can tell the, the, the customer that Terry's got her pasture. She's got these one, this one here, and then she rotates them. I describe Terry's hospital that she's got. She takes the chickens out of the of the of the coop when they when they're sick so that the eggs don't go into that supply. And then she looks after them and makes them better. Um, I, I tell them about the feed and the challenge of feed in South Africa. So these things all, I mean, remember that the consumers that are coming to market are coming to market because they want to be in touch with the people that are making their food, the people, the producers. And this way, through the PGS logo, they can be a little bit closer to that farmer who's, who can't come in and sell their, their, their produce directly. We've got another egg supplier, Farmer Angus. Um, it's a big farm called Spear. And remember about social justice. He gave his chicken in South Africa huge inequality of resources, of in education, like, you know, 400 years of, of, of um, colonialism and apartheid. It takes a long time to correct the, those injustices of the past. So here's Farmer Angus, a very wealthy farm. He gave his chicken business to his staff. He sits on the board so that he can do skills transfer and the, 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 the people that are delivering the, the delivery guys are also the owners when they come and deliver the farmer Angus eggs. So I can tell you customers love to hear that discussion as well. They want to talk about inequality. All right, enough about that. Um, the, the other thing I just want to end off with is that never underestimate the six basic elements in terms of your integrity and in terms of your um, traceability. So the participation in a PGS group is essential. The, if you don't have that participation, you can't actually run a functioning um, PGS group because it is the oversight of other farmers what, looking to see what's happening on other farms. It's the oversight of farmers delivering into um, one market and speaking to each other and saying, oh, how come you've got this? I didn't know it was in season. You know, a little bit, it's a, they call it like a social control, but it's more like a social support really to identify where there might be issues that are happening in your group. And trust, you know, learning to be trustworthy is the first step. And once you are trustworthy yourself, then you can learn to trust other people. And there's nothing like looking in a farmer's eyes on a farm visit and hearing the reasons why that farmer's choosing organic. There was one visit I went to, you know, the farmer was a little bit removed. And I started walked a little bit away with, with, from the group with him and I chatted to him. And, and I questioned him and he turned to me and his eyes flashed. He said, I will never put another um, chemical food, chemically grown food in my, my stomach because I have half an intestine. So, I mean, you know, you get those stories and you see the passion and the commitment in people's eyes. And then that learning process, gee, we have to share what we know. We don't have time for generations to learn from the beginning. We have to share as fast as we can what we know. And then horizontal, 
so important for tra traceability, transparency, and integrity that that must be a flat structure. You can't have one farmer dominating the group. You can't have one market outlet dominating the group. Always look to keeping that process flat. So hopefully, Matt, you can take the the principles and the inspiring principles and put them into that little cell phone app that you're going to create for us. There's one more slide. <laughs> oh, there's one more slide. Hang on a sec. This is beautiful. This is um, Philippi walking along the beautiful, beautiful beds in, in, in the lot of farm. Serena. Samina. So here's a, Samina, sorry. Um, here's a brilliant quote. Traceability in the participatory guarantee system is not just a path from farm to market. It is a journey of authenticity and responsibility. As each step leaves its footprint, transparency grows, connecting producers and consumers in a bond of trust that nourishes sustainable agriculture for generations to come. And that's why we're doing it for okay. the continuation of all of us on the planet. <laughs> okay, that's it. <laughs> Thank you, thank you so much. It's so, so difficult for me to stop you because the stories, uh, I mean, the words that were coming from you are so profound. And um, I tell you, uh, when someone has a wealth of knowledge in a particular field, it's difficult to stop the person while the person is speaking. Thank you I'm so sorry, much. What happened wrong? <laughs> and some of the things that were so profound for me while both of you were speaking was how the market started. You know, many times we wait for projects to start to market for us. And um, this was so profound, like the, the, the garden was there, the farm was there. And then you saw the need to sell. And then you started the market even without PGS. And later on, PGS came because now people are just calling PGS before, uh, without doing the fundamentals that needs to be done before PGS is being formed. And then you talk about educating consumers. That's very key. I mean, that's one thing a lot of our PGSs is lacking. We need to educate the consumers. Bridging short supply chain, this is something that you have created, which is very profound. Record keeping, I can relate with record keeping so well. I, mean, I tell you, it's one of the big issues we have in Ghana too. Farmers keeping record, detailed records of everything they do. It's, it's a big problem. Uh, thank you so much. Without wasting time, I'm just going to allow Matthew to jump into this and uh, dive into the tools that we need to keep us uh, going. Thank you so much. Matthew, over to you. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, great presentation, Audrey and Cheryl, you know, uh, really giving the, the feeling of PGS and why it's so important around redesigning food systems for Africa, you know, and I think um, as we step into the world of technology, you know, we know it's here and, and seeing how that space of technology can blend into that real participation and family that's developed around PGS to make sure that the integrity of the system is, is really at the forefront of that. Um, trust, you know, as, as it was iterated in the previous presentation, is really at the at the main purpose behind PGS, is really giving the consumers the trust in the claims. And as we know, our food system in Africa, South Africa, um, and this is the context of our presentation here, uh, is a very unequal one. We see a lot of extraction, the long supply chains are failing us, and we need to rapidly localize. But in order for us to rapidly localize, we need to get organized and we need to know what's available from a farmer, what's, what's required at a market level, and how we can all participate effectively in a system that brings a new decentralized food system into firm vision. Um, so yeah, and we're just going to be talking a little bit about the, the space that we're occupying in South Africa, particularly around Organic 3.0. And that um, terminology is, is yeah, being pushed by IFOM and it's really taking organic agriculture out the periphery and making it uh, a mainstream word, you know, but less focused on, on export. And I think this is the big thing that, that we're all grappling with is how to really create healthy local food systems that provide for farmers, the people and the environment, most importantly. So what we're trying to achieve here, and, and we're getting quite close, it's often quite tricky to fund innovation like this. Um, you know, digitization of value chains, uh, we've been trying for a couple of years to get it funded, and it often goes over funders' heads, especially if they're not philanthropic. 
but um you know this is really the the space that we're looking to to bring right is is this six step process that we outline on this poster um and and really providing traceability and record keeping for these six steps so you would start at the annual farm visit and audrey was sharing some pictures there about some amazing farms that are supplying aranya zicht and and this is happening more and more regularly not only in south africa but as pgs grows on the continent so the annual farm visit is really the heartbeat of it and and issuing that farm assessment report can often be quite a lengthy process especially if the practitioners are busy um, and what we want to aim to achieve is to digitize that process, make sure that uh, once the farm audit has been complete, that that farm assessment report is available as quickly as possible. Um, that's also linked to the PGS group decision. So whether it's organic or in conversion, or it's a, a revisit at a later date, um, all of that is, is part of the record keeping process of the emergence of PGS groups, the farmers um, growing in their, their knowledge. And the more farmers that we see certified, the better and more efficient our database is going to have to be. So this is kind of what we're preempting and, and aiming to address those challenges as we, as we get there. So the, the farm certification and issuing those reports is, is critical um, because we need to be able to track who needs um, an updated certification and who's next planning the pipeline out for all of the assessors and developing capacity in each province to be able to address the, the huge demand that, that PGS is, is growing with. Getting produce to market, so it, the logistics is often very challenging, as Cheryl outlined. That aggregation model um, and keeping the integrity within the PGS value chain, knowing that most of the aggregators at this stage are also aggregating conventional produce. So we've got to make sure that, especially in an aggregated value chain, that the PGS system is intact um, and this is really what we're doing. So providing that the true assurance to consumers and monitoring the whole process. Slideshow seems to be lagging slightly. So some of the sector challenges that we faced with here is that the food system is, is really not a holistic approach. Um, in South Africa and parts of Africa, we see a huge domination of conventional synthetic agriculture um, with the high use of agrotoxins um, and how that's impacted across the continent, I feel, um, to, to bring about a more equitable food system that is farmer-centered. And when we get that right, we unlock around livelihood development. But it often boils down to data. And if we don't have access to the data, to be able to build these alternative food systems, we're almost shooting in the dark. So what we're aiming to achieve is, is to bypass the existing agricultural value chain. Um, and in South Africa, we see it's 80% of the food traded uh, in the retail spaces as well as central markets. And that value chain is not receptive to small and medium holder farmers at all. The price point is not there. Um, you have to be producing monocrops at extreme hectareage to be able to, to make a living from it. Um, and then that's going back into the extraction of the soil and the water and often for an export market. So we don't see our nutritious organic food being serviced for the local communities. Um, there's also no policy framework that recognizes organic agriculture. So we, we all operating in a bit of a silo or in a bit of a twilight zone, if you like, where we're not recognized. And, and for that reason, we have to be more organized and more efficient in the way that we bring about the emergence of this new food system. There's no national framework for identification and traceability of agricultural products. We are slowly seeing some movement um, on a policy level around the Agricultural Products Standards Act, which is starting to recognize the importance of organic food in food systems and the potential for the contribution to livelihood development as well as the overall economy. And in essence, you know, there, there's so many of these technology platforms that are hitting market, playing that aggregation role, that market access role, but very little on, on data management and record keeping. And that, that's kind of where we're focusing at the moment. You know, we, we're going to be dovetailing with all the other market access platforms that are being born. But the, the most important thing is getting the supply chain and the PGS groups to be organized. Um, and that's really what we're aiming to achieve through this innovation that we're going to be yeah, bring into market in the next year, I would say. 
So when we look at uh, harnessing the sustainable agricultural practices, um, there's a number of different components within that. There's community engagement, landscape and nature conservation, very important aspect of that. Uh, managing your natural resources like water, um, animal husbandry, especially when you look to regenerative agriculture, how you manage your animals on site is, is critical. Um, there's a lot of cases of overgrazing where, uh, especially in the rural areas, um, the cattle just roam and, and they're not managed at all. And that has a really negative impact on the environment. So even looking at um, issues like foot and mouth disease, um, cost the South African government not, not too long ago about 3 billion rand. Um, and that was just due to the lack of risk mitigation around animal husbandry and the traceability within that value chain. Of course, there's a uh, soil fertility and management, which is really at the, the core of PGS. And then from a, a sector wide approach as an organization, you have to be able to manage your programs, uh, your databases of farmers, your emerging PGS groups, and all of the supply chains associated with those groups. So it can get very technical quite quickly when you're looking to digitize um, a food system. So we're starting small and biting off the chunks. But just to give everyone a little bit of um, background, so as the, the NOAM in South Africa, the South African Organic Sector Organization, we are merging um, SALSO and PGSSA into the foundation. And these are six strategic pillars. And the ones highlighted in orange are the, are, is really where the digitization of, of supply chains feature. Um, value chain and market development is there. Networks and partnerships. Program development and innovation, specifically around Organic 3.0. And then, of course, standards and certification, which is what PGS is really cultivating at a grassroots level. So when you look at what digital innovation addresses, you can see it's, it's quite cross-cutting in that regard so as we scaling this out you know we have to find a way to to pin the activities and and the way that it's shaping up at the moment is a, a bit of a tiered approach so on the right hand side the centers of excellence if you like but ultimately training hubs where you can really start developing pgs capacity in each province um, with structured training programs that then link to the PGS groups and start technically supporting those growers um, in, in various ways, from advice on, on production, production planning, uh, accessing bulk inputs, seed, all of those things. So that's really what the center of excellence is, is there to do, is to catalyze the development of, of local food systems. And often those can be linked to the next tier, which are agri-hubs. And once you start linking to an agri-hub, that aggregation model um, starts to unlock. And, and Aranya Zicht, which you just heard about, is, is almost playing that, that, that space where it's really kind of like a market agri-hub, if you like, but a production agri-hub is place based in the community where the extension officers can go and start to service um, the emerging PGS groups. And that's the third tier there. So you can start to get a feel when you start to unpack the, the layering of this, the PGS group is really the grassroots participation at a food system, but then the technical support has to come um, from above. And this is uh, pretty much the methodology that, that's coming to fruition. And some of the, the challenges in the ICT space, and ICT stands for Information Communication Technologies, um, is, is obviously the, the size and the complexity of agricultural value chains, especially when you look at um, some of the main commodities which are traded, um, not that we're advocating for commodity farming, but you know, there are livelihood opportunities, especially for rural farmers. When you look to non-GMO maize, non-GMO soy, sugar beans, and even hemp, which is an emerging sector. So how do you get it organized? And that's the big challenge that we're looking to address. So also complex ecosystems. You've got groups of farmers, consumers, markets, uh, extension offices, NGOs, sector bodies, it's quite a complex ecosystem that you have to map out um, when you start to really get down into the, the nitty gritty of, of food systems. So without going too much into this, I think the, the thing that was really ringing true is that uh, integrity around the identification and traceability of value chains. And this is where PGS is very unique because it brings that, that community assurance where you're working together 
to make sure that the farmers through peer-to-peer -peer assessment, um, as well as the knowledge exchange, are really rising up as a, as a group of farmers. But being able to track and trace, this is going to be quite crucial, um, especially when you start to look at cross-provincial supply chains and, and getting the fruit for more tropical areas and to more dry land areas, uh, it can be quite a complex process to map out. But this is a basic um, value chain understanding. You know, you, you're looking at your first step, which is your land development. Um, and there's various practices such as permaculture land design, um, best practice on the production level. And how does that land development really fit as a heartbeat to how we develop these small farms? And often on the small farms, you, you see a lack of trees, for example. Um, so really integrating, you know, the indigenous trees, indigenous medicinal herbs, essential oils, of course, your, your perennial crops and then your annuals. So when you start to design the land effectively for a stacked business model, uh, farmers are going to be much more sustainable. And that's linked to your farm management. So you can see in that image there on the left hand side is a regenerative farm where they've been holistically grazing cattle. And on the right hand side is, is a farm that's not doing that. And you can see the very clear difference in the, in the soil health. Uh, compared to the, the natural grasslands which are coming through. So preserving the integrity of biomes um, is also a, a long-term strategy that we must look at as organic farmers. Animal husbandries, um, the processing, getting that to retail. Uh, this, this was built on the, the animal value chain, so how to get you know, the, the feedlots out of the equation, but, but bringing in these more holistic rotational grazing farms into this, this value chain. Storage and logistics, retail and consumers, it's, it's all part of this aggregated value chain. And, and it's really important that you map out all components of it. And it can just show in this slide how, how, com how yeah, tricky and complex it can be when you start to try and align offtake agreements to production. Um, you know, we, we wanting to provide security for farmers. Um, so working on a production planning level, you're not going to end up with a glut of spinach at once because that's what we see very often uh, because farmers are still not working yet as a cohesive group. So then often you, you, you find farmers with uh, an excess of, of the basics, you know, the onions, the cabbage, the butternuts, but they're all coming to market at the same time and that drops the, the potential price. So if we are able to holistically production plan and, and manage that supply chain more effectively with quality control, integrity, compliance, we ultimately are mitigating the risk for the farmer. Um, and that really does boil down to participatory production planning with, within PGS groups. Yeah, I think we've, we've spoken about that, but it's also just how you link all of these various people together, the farmer um, into the production, right through to the consumer, the processing, uh, and that's a big piece that, that's not yet quite as crystal as the agro-processing potential within the PGS value chain. And obviously, you know, um, with the, with the agro-processing potential, you can get extended shelf life and then therefore more um, consistent price on, on your products. This is really just a very high level understanding of, of everything that's behind a platform. So there's, there's two different approaches here. You've got a platform approach, and then you've got an app. An app does a very small percentage of what it takes to redesign a food system. A platform, when you start looking at uh, partnership management, traceability and data aggregation, even customer uh, experience support at a call center, for example, we're getting so many queries on, on WhatsApp uh, that come to us, and it's really tough to keep up with that. So you know, having a dedicated customer experience and support is pretty critical. Um, those, those market access platforms, which are developing across the continent, you know, that, that there's, there's one almost coming to, to market every month, um, but not necessarily focused on organic or agroecology, which is really where we need to get to. Um, blending in funding opportunities, microfinancing for farmers. Uh, as we see, you know, the microfinancing space is very difficult for farmers to crack because without records, and without developing trust, you, you, you battle to get the loans. 
especially from the big financing of houses like the banks. They, they're generally financing uh, big commodities, macadamia nuts, maize farms, wheat farms, but that's not necessarily our model. So we almost have to develop an entire ecosystem to support small and medium holder farmers uh, with a full turnkey range of services. Um, and then when you get down to the traceability component, there's technologies such as blockchain that can really bring that to reality. We're in the process of developing a, a basic app at the moment, a proof of concept. Uh, we managed to, to acquire the, the funding to do that. So we, we're quite excited to get this going, um, but it's framed around this sustainable agroecology value chain, which we've been working on for, for some time. But um, a very basic user interface for the farmer, keeping it quite simple on the, on the front end, but the back end would have the complexity as I've just um, shown you on the previous slide. And we've touched on this, but it's really having a handle on all of these various elements, um, especially around the market. And we don't necessarily want to take PGS into formal markets such as Woolworths or Checkers or Pick and Pay. But the thing to be able to create new markets, you have to be organized and you've got to understand your supply and demand ratio, um, especially your consumer segments, how to access the informal market, for example. You know, these traders that are trading out of um, the shipping containers, those are the guys that you want to get to. But um, it's often very complex on a logistics level to be able to connect the dots. Um, and that really does boil down to having access to our own data. And, and the, one of the issues is with outsourcing um, the development of an app to an international company, for example, you don't have that agency over your own data sets. And without that, you might as well not start because if we don't have our data um, and the farmer's data protected, and that can potentially be sold off to a corporate um, like a Bayer or Monsanto, yeah, there's, there's really terrible things that can happen. So we're very, very protective about the data and making sure it's, it's staying in country with backup servers on the cloud and, and potentially areas that we can decentralize the data storage. But ultimately, it's South African data, it's South African innovation, it's African data, it's African innovation, and, and that's where we've got to get to as a continent. You know, We've been extracted for, for far too long. Decades of extraction have hampered Africa, and this is why we are not where we could be, um, especially around food systems and livelihoods. One of the other pieces is situational awareness. You know, just having the ability to map where the farms are, where the market access opportunities are, um, especially looking at the informal markets, where the, the potential for these organic markets to emerge. Having them on GIS is a huge innovation because uh, then you can start to overlay various layers like watersheds, soil quality, biodiversity maps. And then you start to get a real feel for what a decentralized food system can look like that is also very conscious of the environment that we're operating in. So having that ability to overlay all of the various data sets that have been brought, um, and we can often harvest uh, different data sets from different platforms, but ultimately we're developing an agroecological solution for new food, food systems to emerge and the sooner we, we actually have that on a, on a map, the better for us all. So we, we're piloting this with a company called 4 Hour Smart, um, looking at the fourth industrial revolution. And I know that might uh, make the hairs of our next stand up. But you know, at the end of the day, it's not going away. And it's also how we use these various international narratives for the right reasons. Um, and, and we've got to get in there because uh, if we don't, we're going to be laggards and, and the likes of um, agribusiness are going to continue to extract and oppress our farmers. So we have to put a stake in the ground around innovation. And, and this is what we're aiming for. And it's a prototype. You know, we, we're looking firmly to organic 3.0. I'm not going to go too much into the slide, but yeah, when you look at everything involved, it's management, business development, solutioning agri-hub operations, portfolio management, digital operations. Those are just really the core. And when you're looking at business development, it's, it's hard to kind of incubate these social enterprises from agro-processing, primary production, data management, extension service, um, logistics, 
There's so many opportunities in a, in a value chain that is untouched at the moment. We kind of focused on primary production. But if you want to see youth get involved, and, and that's really what we're angling at, is youth are the bridge with technology. And if we can give youth an opportunity to not only earn an income, but develop their livelihoods through various training programs, and, and then to be able to place them on, on farms where they can do their practical experience, that's when we start to see the capacity emerge on a provincial and national level. We can really start to see the boots on the ground um, getting involved in the local food systems, advocating for PGS. So that's, that's really what we, we're aiming for. But when you look at a, a broader framework, you know, organic agriculture focuses on farming, but it's really important, especially in the context of climate change, that we, re we start to get a handle on these other facets which influence farmers. Water, pivotal. Unless we start to really understand our watersheds and take ownership of watersheds as organic farmers, we're always going to be struggling. We keep sinking boreholes, but we're not recharging the aquifers. Um, the soil care, felt care, hunting agroecology, and of course, having programs that can engage with the youth. And that's what we've been doing um, in various formats. We've been doing quite a lot of this work under the banner of Care for the Planet. Um, so we've been prototyping how best to have a holistic understanding. Um, and, and of course, organic agriculture really being one of the center points of that, but we must be mindful of water and the overall biodiversity and, and ecosystems that we're working in. The other big piece that we are looking to address, and, and this is promoted by IFOM and specifically around Organic 3.0, is how to measure um, organic production on a more holistic level. So we, we, we got to start looking at you know, the soil quality, the yield, nutritional quality, social equality is, is really important. You know, how you actually contract your workforce, um, your ecosystem services that are associated, your biodiversity. And, and this is called true cost accounting. And on that diagram over there, you can see conventional on the left and organic on the right. Organic is a far more balanced flower, but we are not yet able to actually get the data we need to measure this properly. And, and that's the, the beauty about a platform is that we can start to pull in various data sets that build up our ability to track and monitor impact. Um, and that's really important for things like uh, getting funding. You know, um, Unfortunately, the fiscal is not forthcoming for many government, governments in Africa. So we have to develop our own avenues to be able to catalyze alternative food systems, work with international donors, but they wanna see impact. They wanna see the data. I want to see exactly how many people are being um, engaged on a program. And of course, it's linked to monitoring and evaluation. And yeah, yeah the sustainable development goals are, are one of these big things that we, we're looking to achieve as or, organic sector bodies or NOAMs or organic farmers or practitioners. Um, you know, coming out of the UN, uh, it's, it's important that we, we know how to utilize these, these measuring frameworks to our advantage. But as you can see, organic agriculture ticks many of these SDGs. So it's also how we tell the story about how we are impacting livelihoods, fixing soil, getting healthy, nutritious food to the communities, developing livelihoods, fixing ecosystems, preserving watersheds. That is really what, what it's about. And being able to track that in a holistic uh, manner is really important. And that boils down to data once again. So when we look to what we are aiming to achieve in South Africa is, is really a strong food system evolution. Uh, we, we've got a failing food system here and the socioeconomic situation isn't getting any better due to the corruption of our government. And unless grassroots take ownership of the way that we produce, link, network, partner to create a new reality, because we don't have to live in this, this one of... Um, extreme government corruption, and we see the, the plight of the people on the ground, it really gets most activists and practitioners fired up. But the main thing is, is we are able to transform on the back of agroecology. So as we see, we, we're going from a, a less centralized food system into a more decentralized food system with the PGS group starting to emerge. We envision a distributed network of PGS groups that cover the entire country and hopefully 
going up into Africa, where we can start to trade with each other. PGS to PGS trade is one of those mechanisms that we're building up toward. But in order to do that, we have to be organized. And this is where technology can play a crucial role in helping us imagine a new future, a future that is mindful of the seventh generation, the ones that have not been born yet, and how we can preserve our soils, our biodiversity, and the beautiful planet that we live on. I'm going to stop there. Thank you very much. Wow. Thank you. Thank you so much, Matthew. And um, I know you have to go now. Um, please, um, I would like to uh, tell everyone that uh, Matthew has a short time with us. And so he might not be present to answer all our questions. But he has promised that we should put the questions in the Q&A and put your email address there. And so we will send all the questions to him and uh, he will answer you via email. Thank you so much. But one question that I have for you is that, mm -hmm. um, you know, this, uh, what you're, what you're putting up is, is tech and it's huge, even though you're starting very small in South Africa. But are we looking at a situation where this platform is open to all Africa, whether we can then divide each country? And so we don't necessarily have to, for example, in Ghana, I have to now start building and duplicate what you have done in South Africa. All we can do is partner together, collaborate together, and you share this platform with all of us in Africa. Is there a way or a thinking around this place? You know, Owami, that, that's a big dream. And, um, you know, the, the thing is that every great movement was started with a dream. And we have this potential as Africa to be the powerhouse on the planet around agriculture. So, of course, we're designing this to scale. We're not going to be keeping it um, specifically for South Africa. And we're very open to partnerships and collaboration. Um, you know, often the tech space is quite tricky to get developers to collaborate. <laughs> you know, even uh, market access platforms to talk to our platform is proving to be quite a tricky thing. But I do believe that the time for innovation is here. And um, we have the solutions as Africans. We are probably one of the most innovative continents on the planet. And when we, we step into that power and take ownership of what we are doing, you know, and telling the story. Of, of the successes that we're already achieving. And we work together as African countries, anything is possible. So I'm, I'm happy to say, I mean, we, we are working quite hard on the background here to make this innovation available, but it starts small, it's proof of concept, and we start to scale from there. But thank you, Owami. And uh, yeah, thank you colleagues for, for listening attentively. Um, I wish I could stick around a bit more, but have to jump into another meeting. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Matthew. And like I said, please, if you have any question or you want to interact with him, uh, please drop your email address in the chat or in the Q&A session, and then we get it across to Matthew, and then he will definitely get back to you. And that's why we didn't take uh, the uh, questions uh, verbally for the first uh, panelist, because Matthew has to jump into another uh, meeting. So um, while we go on this um, roadmap, I would like to uh, indulge everyone that we just take the last presenter and then we can come back to the verbal uh, question and answer if um, there are still more questions that people would like to ask verbally from all our, our panelists. So our next presenter is uh, Amidu uh, from Mali. And um, thank God we have a French speaker this time around. So we English speaking will have to listen while the French uh, will have to take uh, the button this time around. Uh, I will give him the floor so that he can introduce himself better. Thank you. Over to you, Hamid. Right. Bonjour. Bonjour. Vous m'entendez bien? <coughs> Bonjour. Bonjour. Yes, we can hear you. 
Ok, d'accord. Merci. Et j'ai l'honneur de vous présenter l'initiative PGS du Mali, notamment Biolocal Mali, qui intervient dans le cadre du projet d'appui au développement d'un système participatif de garantie. Attendez, voilà, ça c'est ça. OK. Donc, euh, comme je l'ai dit, c'est Amiché Amidou Adjawara, président de l'ONG MSD, maître formateur en agriculture biologique et président du comité national de certification qui coordonne toutes les activités de certification au Mali dans le cadre du label SPG Biolocal. Et ce projet est soutenu par nos partenaires financiers et le monde, et, 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 notamment appelé SOSFIN Belgique. Alors, le contexte d'intervention de ce projet vise la valorisation des produits agroécologiques et biologiques au Mali à travers la mise en place d'un système participatif de garantie impliquant les producteurs, les distributeurs, les transformateurs qui sont déclarés conformes au nombre de productions biologiques établies par un cahier de charge conforme et consensuel accepté par tous les acteurs. Il y a comme objectif faire du SPG un moyen d'atteindre les objectifs du développement durable créer des marchés agroécologiques et biologiques, faciliter l'intégration des produits biologiques sur les marchés locaux et national, faire de l'agriculture biologique le moteur de développement de l'économie rurale et de promouvoir les alternatives de production et des techniques de production agroécologique et dynamiser les échanges entre les tiroirs, participer à la création des liens sociaux entre les agriculteurs et les consommateurs, notamment à ce qui est il s'agit aussi de réussir la transition agroécologique de plus de 1350 producteurs au Mali durant les prochaines années à venir. Et pour le rappel, le cahier de charges que nous utilisons pour le cas du label biolocal a une historique, notamment une première version qui a vu le jour en 2017 avec plus de 30 producteurs sur 5 hectares et une version intermédiaire en juillet 2021 et une version finale en 2022 avec l'appui du partenaire SOSFIN. Euh, qui a facilité et recruté du personnel pour mieux implanter et toucher plus de quatre régions, plus les districts de Bamako actuellement. Alors, les acteurs qui sont impliqués dans le processus de certification, puisqu'on l'a dit, un système participatif euh, a comme gage un, quand il est inclusif et participatif. Et nous avons des producteurs et individuels ou en coopératif, des consommateurs, des transformateurs des distributeurs, des sociétés de recherche, des professionnels de l'agroécologie, notamment des plateformes, des entreprises d'intrants bio et des fournisseurs, des services techniques, notamment les ministères de l'agriculture, de l'environnement et de la santé, des associations de consommateurs, des agronomes, des étudiants, toutes les parties prenantes participent aux dynamiques du processus de certification dans le cadre du SPG biolocal. Alors, comme objectif et résultat, nous avons et en compte, et le label SPGB local nous donne comme résultat notamment l'abandon des pesticides et engrais chimiques et initier les producteurs dans les bonnes pratiques agroécologiques et autres acteurs de l'économie sociale avec une attention particulière pour les jeunes et les femmes qui jouissent des conditions de vie améliorées. Et aussi des producteurs agroécologiques et biologiques qui sont encadrés et certifiés par les labels des producteurs conventionnels sont aussi sensibilisés, mobilisés et convertis en négatifs biologiques avec un plan d'accompagnement, bien sûr, et offrir aussi un cadre facilitant de commercialisation des producteurs qui sont certifiés et garantir un prix équitable et juste aux producteurs. Aussi, la sensibilisation des plaidoyers auprès des consommateurs et aussi auprès de la population et des acteurs étatiques et aussi contribuer à réduire l'impact écologique et énergétique de l'agriculture, notamment les CDN, pays Mali et accord de Paris sur le climat, ainsi aussi contribuer à l'atteinte des outils de développement durable et l'agenda 20 central de l'Union africaine et contribuer à la Convention de Rotterdam sur les pesticides. Alors, nous intervenons dans quatre régions, Kai, Koulikoro, Sikasso, Ségou, le décès de Bamako. Et l'organe de gouvernance du SPG bio local est géré par le Comité national de certification, qui est une innovation majeure au sein de notre système de certification, qui regroupe 
plus d'une douzaine d'acteurs, notamment des, des fêtières et d'organisations paysannes, des acteurs étatiques, des sociétés civiles, coopératives, des paysans et des fermiers. Et alors, il est illustré comme suit. Le Sénat, comité national de certification, est compris de plusieurs structures, comme je l'avais dit, et aussi impliqué des acteurs étatiques au niveau local, notamment des préfets, des, 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 des maires, des services techniques qui sont qui, au niveau décentralisé, qui participent à l'évaluation des pairs, à la vérification des parcelles avec les producteurs qui sont certifiés. Alors, au-dessus du comité de certification, le secrétaire est géré par l'ONG MSD avec une équipe technique qui est recrutée pour la cause, pour accompagner et suivre les producteurs et l'animation la, des marchés. Aussi, les points focaux au niveau de centralisé en lien avec les comités locaux de certification qui participent au contrôle des suivis rapprochés avec les producteurs, avec une inspection euh, annuelle par mois et aussi des visites inopinées par l'équipe technique recrutée à cet effet. Le comité national, comme je l'ai dit, c'est l'organe qui valide tous les dossiers de certification après l'enrichissement, l'évaluation des producteurs qui sont conformes aux principes de production biologique qui signent et qui sont validés après par les membres du comité national lors d'une rencontre en image sur dossier qui valide, qui examine si les, les producteurs sont conformes aux principes de production biologique et au cahier des charges que nous avons défini consensuellement. Et aussi le secrétariat d'appui, qui est l'organe technique, qui est le secrétariat qui occupe de la documentation, les suivis, les contrôles, l'exclusion, les sanctions, l'animation du marché, qui est et sont des personnels recrutés par l'ONG MSD en, en lien avec l'accompagnement des partenaires financiers pour faciliter tous les travaux parce qu'il s'agit des quatre régions et des décès de Bamako. Alors, le processus de certification est constitué des étapes bien euh, importantes parce qu'il s'agit de visionner et de faire en sorte que les, tous les acteurs qui sont concernés dans le processus de certification adhèrent au concept, notamment les respects des cahiers de charges, de ne pas utiliser les produits chimiques, de ne pas utiliser les engrais chimiques, mais de développer des alternatives et de s'engager dans cette dynamique. Et l'adhésion volontaire, l'adhésion est volontaire. Et aussi des visites, accepter des visites d'évaluation des producteurs selon une grille de notation que nous avons élaborée et avec un engagement écrit sur les fiches d'engagement et de ne pas utiliser les produits chimiques et d'engrais chimiques. Et ces dossiers sont validés et transmis au niveau local et au niveau national au sein du comité national qui statue si ces fiches d'inscription et les valide ou les rejette. Et aussi des contrôles de conformité sont organisés par l'équipe technique en lien avec les colloques et les élites les services techniques et les sensibilités du village pour eh, traduire leur implication efficace au processus de certification et aussi des séances de démonstration culinaire et de communication des plaidoyers sont organisées au profit de ces acteurs sur toute la chaîne. Et ce qui traduit par des visites, des parcelles, des plaques d'identification avec des numéros de contact du de, de secrétariat, notamment de l'ONG et du comité national pour, des cas, pour dénoncer des cas de fraude ou de, de malveillance ou même d'erreur. Parce que certains peuvent, après certification, utiliser les produits chimiques. Donc, il faut un lien direct entre ces parcelles qui, qui devient une propriété pas, euh, publique, pas seulement des producteurs. Parce que chaque personne qui est intéressée à visiter les, les, les parcelles sont autorisées au nom du principe des cahiers de charge à aller faire des visites et rendre compte s'il y a des manquements. Parce que euh, euh, le comité national sait ne peut pas surveiller, mais les consommateurs, les autres acteurs au niveau local peuvent contribuer à faire des dénonciations aussi. Et aussi l'accompagnement de ces formateurs, notamment comment faire des composts, des biopesticides. L'équipe technique euh, composée des agronomes et des ingénieurs facilite avec des modules de formation que nous avons élaborés à cet effet. Et aussi, tout cela est finalisé par la remise d'un certificat et avec un, un, une remise officielle des producteurs que nous accompagnons, avec des sensibilisations et des actions impliquant les autorités locales et administratives et des services techniques aussi. Alors, par rapport aux acquis de la commercialisation des produits biologiques des SPG bio locales, nous avons organisé plusieurs marchés biologiques, notamment des foires, des, des salons, des marchés bio locaux, des, des week-ends bio et des boutiques bio que nous avons aussi, qui contribuent à la communication, à, la, à communiquer sur la disponibilité des produits auprès des consommateurs 
et pour faciliter l'identification de nos produits au sein des autres produits, puisque les marchés bio et exclusifs ne sont pas aussi nombreux actuellement, mais il s'agit aussi pour nous de développer des marchés physiques pour orienter plus les consommateurs vers ce type de marché, notamment l'identification de nos produits à travers un label, comme vous voyez sur le cas des boutiques et les manques bio avec l'effigie SPG bio local. Alors, pour le souris, euh, tout ceci nous a amené à faire une cartographie d'abord pour identifier les potentiels producteurs agroécologiques sur le territoire, notamment dans les quatre régions, et aussi qui nous a permis de, 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 de séparer, identifier et accompagner et dans notre base de données proprement dites, notamment euh, plus de 2000, euh, 2195 ont été identifiés dans la région de Kaïselma et aussi 1049 dans la région de Sougou et de Sa, notamment sur une superficie de 358 44 hectares en production animale et végétale concernant plus de 52 villages. C'est un peu la cartographie de notre intervention euh, des acteurs agroécologiques et écologiques dans notre zone d'intervention. Et comme résultat de 2021 à 2023, nous avons un nombre de producteurs accompagnés pour la certification, plus de 806, et nombre d'hectares cultivés dans les maraîchages en recettant les cahiers des chars SPG, c'est de 64. Le nombre d'hectares exploités pour la culture céréalière, maïs, pognon, sésame, bio, en respectant bien sûr les cahiers des charges, est de 72. Et, et, 72. et le no volume des produits certifiés, c'est de 53 tonnes. Le volume des produits maraîchers est de 97 tonnes. Le pourcentage des hommes et femmes certifiés SPG par rapport aux producteurs accompagnés est de 45 Et le pourcentage des produits maraîchers certifiés SPG vendus via les marchés organisés est de 30 la différence des prix entre les prix conventionnels et les prix certifiés de notre label SPG local est d'environ 70% pour le moment. Le niveau de soutien des autorités locales dans le processus de certification est de nombre dix initiatives et le nombre de villages qui contribuent à la promotion, à la, et aux activités de promotion des projets de certification est de 52 villages et le nombre de marchés biologiques que nous avons organisés, en, contrôlés par euh, les labels est co-organisé avec les autres acteurs et le nombre de 12. Le nombre de rencontres du comité national de certification pour la validation, la sanction, l'évaluation et des 12 initiatives à ces jours. Tout ceci, ce sont des activités que nous avons réalisées, notamment et avec des produits transformés, des produits frais et des foires, des expositions que nous organisons. Alors, concernant proprement l'organisation du marché, il est défini selon la stratégie. Quatre marchés physiques contrôlés normalement par l'ONG MSD et les autres sont en co-organisation parce que nous n'avons pas l'ambition seule d'animer les marchés. Nous le faisons toujours en contribution avec les autres acteurs qui ont les, les mêmes visions que euh, la certification et l'agriculture biologique. Et notamment, vous voyez, il y a les producteurs urbains, il y a les producteurs périurbains qui aussi s'organisent pour l'animation des marchés et des foires, impliquant tout le processus impliqué, 20 producteurs individuels et plus de 13 OP. Les OP, c'est des coopératives ou des unions de coopératives qui sont regroupées en coopératives entre 20 et 120 membres par structure. Tous ceux-ci sont organisés avec la production de plusieurs filières impliquant 26 spéculations. Alors, des marchés physiques comme des marchés virtuels aussi sont organisés, notamment des produits frais et des produits transformés. Et tout ceci est géré par le comité national de certification à travers les secrétariats et dont l'équipe technique est chargée d'animer les marchés avec un gestionnaire qui prend en compte les informations, les orientations, la restauration des prix et la restauration des produits avec des commerçants, avec des distributeurs mais des produits, qui sont aussi des producteurs et des distributeurs parce qu'il y a certains producteurs qui, sont, qui vendent directement leurs produits. Donc, nous les facilitons la traçabilité de ces produits avec des QR codes de traçabilité parce que chaque producteur certifié reçoit un code d'identification dont la traçabilité se retrouve sur leurs produits jusqu'au lieu de vente. Et aussi des factures de bordereaux d'achat et aussi des espaces clients de gestion des commandes à travers une application que notre partenaire est sur fait à faciliter avec Dolifam, qui est une plateforme open source qui facilite la, les commandes, la gestion des factures jusqu'à la livraison des produits que nous sommes en train d'expérimenter pour le moment. Alors, la communication pour nos marchés est une stratégie euh, qui gagne parce que les consommateurs ne sont pas au courant 
de ces dynamiques le plus souvent. Donc, il faut créer des espaces dédiés à la promotion de ces produits, notamment des affiches des dépliants, et la presse, les radios, les véhicules des messages et même passer dans les universités, des, les marchés, les micro-trottoirs pour expliquer. Et tout ceci est facilité aussi parce que nous avons mis en œuvre une plateforme agroécologique facilitée par BioVision Africa Trust dans le cadre du projet EOA qui s'occupe de la communication par rapport à toutes nos activités liées à l'agroécologie, à l'agriculture biologique, aussi à la commercialisation. Aussi, euh, les marchés, plusieurs marchés ont vu les jours, notamment, notamment si la filière sésame et la filière fonio dans le cadre du projet EOA, et aussi d'autres produits, euh, notamment les produits euh, frais, et aussi impliquer des anciens ministres de l'agriculture qui participent à la promotion et qui véhicule des messages auprès du public via les radios, les télé, pour inciter les consommateurs à s'intéresser à ce type d'agriculture qui respecte l'environnement, qui respecte euh, la biodiversité et qui respecte la santé humaine. Et comme vous voyez, je l'ai dit, les types de vente sont aussi des paniers virtuels qui sont facilités par des coursiers qui livrent aussi certains consommateurs directement chez eux notamment au temps du COVID, et ça a été un grand succès parce que les gens n'avaient plus le temps de sortir, mais les ventes en ligne ont facilité, ont rapproché les consommateurs à leurs produits, et aussi des espaces de vente physiques, notamment organisés chaque week-end pour faciliter la dessinité et rapprocher les produits aux consommateurs. Comme je l'ai dit, la communication est l'une de nos stratégies qui facilite aussi la compréhension, l'initiative, pourquoi il faut consommer ces produits, d'où ça vient, qui le font. C'est vraiment important pour celui qui achète de savoir qu'il ne le fait pas pour l'argent, mais il le fait vraiment pour le respect du vivant, parce que la, les pesticides, c'est à peu près 200 morts par jour à cause des, 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 des dangers liés aux toxicités de ces produits et des cancers qui sont liés. Donc, ce qui respecte de, de garantir la santé des consommateurs mérite d'être reconnu. Et raison pour laquelle nous donnons toujours dans nos espaces la parole aux paysans, aux producteurs et aux consommateurs pour qu'ils expliquent leur parcours, pourquoi ils consomment ces produits, pourquoi les producteurs aussi, ils ont choisi l'agriculture biologique. Donc, ce sont ces espaces qui nous organisons au-delà même des marchés biologiques que nous organisons. Notre marché biologique a des concepts bien précis. Le marché est toujours associé au débat, aux échanges entre les différents acteurs qui viennent sur le marché pour qu'on puisse comprendre qu'est-ce que le SPG et qu'est-ce que l'agriculture biologique et quelle est la vision à tenir auprès des consommateurs. Et tous les acteurs. Et aussi, par rapport à la communication, les séances de solaire sont couramment dispensées auprès des populations qui sont à la certification et qui facilite la compréhension avec des images, des visuels. Aussi, des réunions de sensibilisation auprès des producteurs sont facilitées par l'équipe technique dans les zones d'intervention qui contribuent à améliorer les, les, les renforcements des capacités ou aussi l'appréciation des consommateurs pour les produits certifiés. Et tous aussi et contribuer à la promotion du riz biologique. Nous avons noué des partenariats avec la plateforme nationale des producteurs du riz du Mali, qui aussi ont une vision pour renforcer la disponibilité des produits du riz qui facilite aussi euh, la promotion des produits biologiques, notamment certifiés. Alors, par rapport à la traçabilité, les plaques d'identification, comme vous le voyez, on l'a un peu zoomé pour comprendre. Il y a les noms de l'opérateur, par exemple, les types de production, les statuts de l'opérateur, le code d'identification que nous avons identifié pour tous les producteurs et qui est adossé à une base de données. Toutes les informations de suivi de contrôle que nous menons auprès de chaque opérateur certifié sont renseignées automatiquement dans cette base de données. Par exemple, si l'opérateur à utiliser quel type d'intrants, les rendements et les sanctions, par exemple, lors de la visite inopinée, si on a trouvé des traces de pesticides ou d'engrais, des sacs vides, 
Donc, nous les recensons. Si nous avons formé cet opérateur, nous le capitalisons aussi dans la base de données. Donc, en une année, on a la situation actuelle photographiée avec des images aussi de l'ensemble des propriétaires que nous accompagnons. En cas de fraude ou bien de manquement à ces respects, les numéros de contact ci-dessus permettent aux autres consommateurs de dénoncer et d'alerter au moins pour anticiper sur des cas de risque et de fraude. Tout ceci sur des produits commercialisés sous forme de paniers ou dans les marchés biologiques avec des étiquettes pour orienter le consommateur sur la qualité intrinsèque de ces produits. Alors, des visites des marchés, d'autres marchés sont aussi organisés en lien pour créer des liens avec d'autres acteurs agroécologiques du Mali pour s'enquérir de leurs états et des difficultés et partager nos expériences par rapport au développement et à la stratégie pour mieux orienter les consommateurs et faciliter l'accès des produits biologiques au Mali. Comme je l'ai dit, 12 marchés physiques sont actuellement à notre actif à travers quatre marchés euh, contrôlés et organisés par le comité national de certification géré par l'ONG MSD et aussi des partenaires de mise en œuvre qui sont au niveau décentralisé, notamment l'Union des propriétaires de Sésam, Fenabe à Bougouni, Senopé à Bamako, Kayeb à Koulokani et d'autres acteurs qui sont au niveau décentralisé, qui contribuent et qui font la promotion et des, organisent des marchés euh, physiques dans leur localité aussi. Alors, les marchés, et comme euh, et, et stratégie, un chargé de commercialisation est recruté pour s'occuper et prendre en compte la réception, l'écoulement des produits sur les marchés et aussi travailler en Parce que les deux numéros qu'on on communique auprès des consommateurs ou bien de la population, c'est pour nous recenser les cas. des besoins, des difficultés et des recommandations, des conseils de ceux qui l'utilisent. S'il n'y a pas de retour direct entre ceux qui utilisent ou qui sont certifiés entre nous tout le temps, ça va contribuer à ralentir ou bien à décourager certains. Raison pour laquelle nous avons vraiment mis l'accent sur ces deux concepts et le centre d'appel du coup du label SPG bio local a des objectifs recenser les plaintes, les conseils, les recommandations, mais aussi recenser, collecter les informations chaque semaine auprès des opérateurs certifiés pour prendre contact avec eux et regarder quelles sont les difficultés et les volumes de vente directe, parce qu'il y a certains qui vendent directement leurs produits et recenser toutes ces informations dans un registre de vente que nous avons à notre et qui nous facilite de prendre des biologies qui sont organisées. Et la fixation, la fixation des prix est, un, est très importante parce qu'il nous, il nous donne la garantie que le producteur en question a les bons prix et un prix juste. Et pour donner quelques détails, le prix est fixé entre 20 à 30 au minimum pour chaque marché que nous organisons. L'idée, c'est de créer une différence des prix d'abord entre les prix conventionnels et les prix euh, biologiques. Voilà. Et des concerts avec les producteurs. Par exemple, dans un marché, vous allez voir que d'autres peuvent vendre les, les tomates à 400, d'autres à 300, d'autres à 250. Alors, lors d'un marché, au lieu de faire 400, 250, on uniformise le, le, le coût total, par exemple, plafonné à 400 pour que ceux qui voulaient vendre à 250 puissent euh, rattraper le surplus et uniformiser pour que tout le monde, euh, personne ne perde. Donc, c'est une stratégie que nous avons mis en œuvre avec euh, le soin de l'équipe technique. Et pour chaque marché, nous, organisons, nous fixons un prix équitable pour tous les producteurs. Ça, c'est l'une de nos euh, axes prioritaires aussi. Alors, on a des boutiques bio qui facilite aussi la disponibilité et la communication de nos produits auprès des producteurs et des consommateurs qui viennent aussi déposer souvent leurs produits qui sont transformés, l'huile de sésame et le fonio précuit et des produits transformés ici ou semi-transformés. Les produits frais sont des disponibles que les week-ends, les samedis et les dimanches. Et une fois par mois, nous organisons un grand marché accessible au grand format avec tous les acteurs pour euh, euh, amorcer la dynamique des marchés agroécologiques en fonction de la disponibilité des consommateurs.
et aussi les promesses de vente que nous utilisons, c'est des produits bio et locaux moins chers et aussi des produits sains, sans intrants chimiques, sans pesticides et sans engrais qui garantissent une alimentation saine et plus de santé pour la terre, pour les humains, pour la biodiversité. Parce que sans promesse de vente, il faut garantir ces qualités intrinsèques de nos produits auprès des populations, auprès de la, euh, des consommateurs. C'est vraiment important. Raison pour laquelle nous faisons des publicités, des affiches au grand format pour les consommateurs. Alors, nous avons une fiche de collecte, comme je l'ai dit. Nous avons plusieurs outils à notre sein. Nous avons une base de données, des fiches d'inscription et un certificat qu'on remet à chaque producteur certifié et aussi des modules de formation disponibles au cas par cas pour chaque producteur en cas de besoin de formation. Alors, ces outils permettent de renseigner et opérateur par opérateur, lié de provenance des produits, le code de certification, le type de culture, la quantité, les prix et aussi sur la, la qualité des produits. Tout ça, c'est pour vraiment garantir la qualité des produits parce que les consommateurs, une fois hors du marché, peuvent avoir des problèmes. Donc, ça nous permet de faire la traçabilité de ces produits et corriger in fine ces manquements ou des petites erreurs qui peuvent survenir. Comme je l'ai dit, le centre d'appel est géré par des euh, techniciennes qui garantissent euh, la qualité et par des appels. Nous avons des euh, numéros fixes qui permettent de recevoir et d'appeler les producteurs une fois par, par semaine. Nous appelons tous les producteurs qui sont certifiés, qui sont dans notre base de données, données et nous sommes en permanence en contact avec eux. Ça permet de vraiment garantir la confiance entre l'organe de certification et les producteurs et tous les autres acteurs. Et plusieurs types de marchés, donc vous voyez avec l'implication des anciens ministres, des débats sur l'agriculture biologique, les alternatives aux pesticides, aussi des plateformes Web TV qui permettent de, de, de renforcer la communication. et de partager des informations au grand format et qui sont accessibles partout sur les YouTube et la visibilité. Des visites d'échange avec des euh, entreprises qui sont certifiées, par exemple l'entreprise Kenya qui fait la transformation des tisanes qui sont certifiées par les SPG Bio local. Des rencontres aussi avec un réseau Rezapac au Mali qui est bien dans la promotion aussi des produits agroécologiques et biologiques. Donc, comme je l'ai dit, nous ne sommes pas figés entre nous. Nous sommes toujours ouverts aux autres initiatives locales pour échanger, permettre de se connaître et voir dans quels axes de coopération on peut mieux servir les consommateurs en exigeant la qualité des produits biologiques. Et des visites d'échange avec des femmes vendeuses de Kalamankuro qui sont des producteurs, euh, des vendeuses conventionnelles. Mais nous, nous profitons de ces sorties pour les expliquer l'intérêt de faire la promotion des produits agroécologiques et biologiques qui pensent qu'avec un appui ou bien en installant des marchés physiques proprement aux produits bio, pourrait aussi garantir la qualité et insérer ces femmes qui sont disponibles et, et, ça, et se sont engagées à quitter les marchés conventionnels pour venir dans les marchés euh, biologiques en vendant exclusivement avec des opérateurs certifiés, avec des codes et des systèmes de traçabilité que nous avons mis en œuvre pour faciliter ou augmenter le volume de vente de nos produits certifiés. Alors, l'un des qualités aussi, c'est la gouvernance horizontale du SPG avec les collectivités. Ici, l'image du maire de Bagneda avec les propriétaires de riz qui, qui s'engage à accompagner la dynamique du projet de certification dans sa commune et faire des plaidoyers auprès des autres acteurs. Aussi, euh, on a, le Mali dispose d'un décret sur le procès de labellisation en agriculture biologique avec le ministère de l'Agriculture. Ça, c'était lors d'un atelier que nous avons euh, validé un cahier de charges consensuel propre à l'agriculture biologique et qui est au, au ministère de l'Agriculture, qui va servir aussi de gage pour les acteurs qui vont intervenir dans l'agriculture biologique. Dans notre cas, notre SPG n'est pas isolé. Tout ce que nous faisons, nous le faisons en contribution avec les services techniques de l'État, avec les autres acteurs. 
le ministère de l'Environnement ou le ministère de la Santé, parce que seul, on ne peut pas amorcer cette dynamique de transition agroécologique. Mais avec tous les acteurs, avec tous les fils du pays, nous pouvons eh, gagner le terrain, nous pouvons sensibiliser et à, à garantir la qualité de nos produits et offrir des produits sains, sans danger pour toute la population malienne. C'est ça notre engagement pour euh, euh, ces labels. Et voici le secrétaire général du ministère de l'Agriculture lors de l'atelier de validation des cahiers de charges euh, agroécologiques et biologiques avec le, ministre, euh, le directeur national de l'agriculture et tous les services techniques et les acteurs de la société civile. Aussi, des ateliers de partage sont organisés avec d'autres acteurs, notamment la plateforme. OK. Euh, aussi, de... I'm sorry to interrupt. You have a okay. few more minutes. Madhu? OK. Donc, euh, des ateliers, des rencontres d'échange pour terminer. Et aussi des partenaires qui nous accompagnent dans la dynamique euh, BioVision et OA. Et Estos Fin est notre partenaire principal qui accompagne cette dynamique au Mali pour 2022-2026 et aussi d'autres partenaires euh, comme euh, IFOAM, Fubol, EOA et Agroécologie Web TV, qui est une plateforme Web TV. Alors, je vous remercie. Si j'ai pris un peu trop de temps, voilà. Thank you so much, Hamadou. Uh, merci beaucoup. Um, the microphone is now open and um, we have at this junction, we'll be taking questions from anyone who has a question. Uh, thank you so much for the Mali experience. Uh, while people are getting ready to uh, ask questions, I have one question for you, which I know is going to benefit everybody. You talked about pricing, and I want to know who controls the price, who decides the price, because you mentioned there that you have a fixed price. So who decides? the price? Is it the committee? Is it the farmer that decide uh, the price for each product? Thank you. La question, les, les prix, c'est pour notre cas, les prix, c'est les producteurs et facilité par l'équipe technique qui encadre, mais il n'a pas le dernier mot. Le dernier mot revient au, au producteur. Thank you. Um, if you have any other question, can you please raise your hand? Okay. And then we'll call you uh, Bakri. Can you unmute yourself? Oui, uh, voilà. Uh, pour moi, ce n'est pas une question, c'est juste contribuer par rapport au prix. Voilà, donc euh, je suis également, euh, je suis l'ingénieur agronome du projet SPG au Mali, voilà, pour la certification des produits agroécologiques. En ce qui concerne la fixation du prix, donc lors des marchés organisés, nous, nous prenons concertation avec tous les producteurs qui exposent les produits ici dans les marchés. Et on, par exemple, pour un seul produit, la tomate, vous verrez qu'avec trois producteurs, on va prendre le prix. Le premier producteur qui vend à 300 francs, un second qui, fend, qui vend son produit à 400 francs et, et un troisième à 500 francs. On essaye de faire le cumul et d'avoir un prix moyen qui va permettre au, au producteur d'avoir un prix rémunérateur et un prix qui ne va pas être plus haut par, par rapport à l'achat aussi. Donc, il faut, il faut que le produit soit économiquement accessible. Voilà, donc vous verrez que le prix sera vraiment un prix moyen qui arrange non seulement le producteur et le consommateur. Merci. Thank you. Um, the next person will be Gosha. Sorry if I didn't pronounce your name well, but please go yes, for good. it. Yes, good morning, everyone. Uh, I have a question. I want to know how you, uh, the farmers pay for the contribution for the PGS to get a certificate of PGS, how it costs and how you calculate the price. Thank you. Uh, 
any of the panelists can answer this, uh, whether from the South Africa, Hango, or from Mali, you are free to answer. Hi, it's Audrey here. Um, you know, in South Africa, there's been different mechanisms between different groups. Um, some of the groups in the kind of urban areas, like in Joburg, they were charging like a 200 Rand membership. I don't know what that is translated into, um, you know, EU or any other currency, but 200 Rand a year. Um, and then there was thought about charging for the actual assessment, but what we've noticed in the development of PGS in this country after we got some funding to to roll out a bigger program is that um, that the, the big need is for the administrators, the people, the facilitators, the people that are going on the visits. It's their time in preparing for the farm visit, um, doing the farm visit and writing the report. It's their their time and we did find some funding for that but it's not sustainable we need to find a sustainable way to support pgs and it and although the farmers should contribute remember they're contributing their time so a lot of groups are saying okay we're not talking money now we're saying you give us your time for your agms for training and for coming to all the farm visits and your time is also your money. And then in exchange, other people will come and do the certification at your farm and they will give you their time. So it's almost like a, a barter of people's time. That's what we're trying to, to use at the moment. But, um, and I think that there are many other examples where there are costs involved, but at the moment, most groups are not charging anything. Um, and at most it's, a, it's around 200 Rand. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Musa, can you unmute yourself? Oi, bonjour. Bonjour, est-ce que... Oui, ok, merci beaucoup. Uh, merci au présentateur. Euh, moi, je suis euh, Moussa Barrault, je suis du Burkina Faso, donc, euh, également membre du comité central de certification voilà, au, du SPG à voilà, Burkina Faso, mis en place par le scénario du Conseil national pour l'agriculture biologique. Euh, J'aimerais savoir, par rapport à la fixation des prix, est-ce que d'abord, euh, il y a eu un travail de structuration des prix avec les producteurs parce que j'imagine que d'une région à une autre, ce n'est pas exactement les mêmes coûts de production. Et est-ce que ce, ce travail a été fait? Et par rapport également aux différents intrants euh, qui, sont, qui, sont, qui sont utilisés, j'imagine que les producteurs n'utilisent pas exactement les, les mêmes types d'intrants ni les mêmes quantités. Est-ce que par rapport à cette fixation des prix-là, il y a une fourchette qu'on donne? et non un prix directement qui est fixé que tous le, tout les producteurs doivent respecter. Voilà, merci. Um, Amadou, do you want to answer that question? OK. OK, et merci Barou pour la question. Par rapport à la circulation des, des prix, euh, j'aimerais au moins apporter euh, la clarification la gestion des prix est très compliquée a été très compliquée pour nous dès le départ parce qu'à cause du prix il y a beaucoup, certains producteurs qui sont retournés sur des mauvaises pratiques et qui sont même sortis du système de certification parce qu'ils les arrivaient à produire et à laisser le marché étant des producteurs biologiques et vendre au même prix que ceux du conventionnel et ça, ça a été vraiment la... inacceptable pour eux, vu l'effort, ne pas utiliser les produits chimiques et aller, parce que quand on produit en agriculture biologique, il y a l'aspect aussi visuel de ces produits. Souvent, les produits conventionnels sont beaucoup plus jolis, l'aspect est beaucoup plus attirant que les produits biologiques. Et là, sur le marché, les produits conventionnels ont beaucoup plus de... de, de, de des de visions, de beaucoup plus d'appréciation auprès des consommateurs et ils sont beaucoup plus tentés à acheter 
les produits conventionnels. Donc, ça a découragé beaucoup. Nous, la stratégie que nous avons maintenue, c'est de maintenir 20 à 30 des différences au même type de culture conventionnelle comparée à l'agriculture biologique au moment de la récolte. Si la pomme de terre conventionnelle est 500, nous, on rajoute 20 à 30 applicables sur le produit biologique avant à commercialiser sur le produit. Maintenant, d'une région à d'une autre, par exemple, certains peuvent appliquer 10 d'autres peuvent appliquer 15 d'autres peuvent appliquer 30 et même exceptionnellement, certains même aller jusqu'à 50 exceptionnellement. Bien vrai que ce n'est pas l'objectif parce que plus les, plus les prix sont élevés, plus on handicap les, les consommateurs moyens à accéder à ce type de produit. Alors que l'objectif de la certification aussi, c'est de garantir la qualité de ces produits à tous. C'est-à-dire que les gens qui ont des revenus intermédiaires, des gens qui ne sont pas aussi en mesure d'acheter des produits est trop cher. Donc, voici un peu la stratégie que nous avons développée pour faciliter la, et garantir l'accès de nos produits à tous, sans exception. So, uh, we have um, three more minutes uh, before our time, but I would like to uh, give uh, more opportunity to people that are that wants to ask questions directly. But if we cannot get to you, please put your question in the Q&A uh, session and the panelists will answer. Please, please um, the next person will be um, Yakubwa. Oui, bonjour. Bonjour. Bonjour, est-ce que vous m'entendez? Oui, merci. Merci, Hamidou Diawara. C'est un plaisir. Moi, je suis Yakubwa Keita, je suis du Sénégal. On a mis en place une toute nouvelle association que nous avons racine. Alors, nous voulions d'abord saluer cette initiative de présentation de SPG parce que nous avons commencé à faire des cahiers de charges sur SPG. Ma question, je crois que ça a été un peu plus répondu par rapport au prix. Donc, voilà, c'est par rapport surtout à ce qu'on appelle nos comptes d'exploitation prévisionnels. Donc, on peut normalement faire par des choses, surtout la question des prix. Donc, j'aimerais euh, avoir plus d'informations. Est-ce que vous faites ça pour avoir des prix Vous pouvez vous harmoniser avec les producteurs, mais surtout, quelle est la place et la demande des consommateurs par rapport à Can, voilà. Yakuba, can you make the question short Oui. Very short. Hello. Can you make the question very est short? Est-ce que c'est bon maintenant? Est-ce que c'est bon? The interpreters are not getting your questions. Oui. D'accord. Je demandais par rapport au prix. Est-ce qu'on se base sur un compte d'exploitation prévisionnel ou bien c'est juste un accord entre les producteurs? Mais quelle est la place aussi du consommateur par rapport à la fixation des prix? C'est l'objectif quand même de l'activité biologique, ce n'est pas de vendre plus cher. Mais c'est d'essayer de réduire les intrants pour les producteurs pour trouver le même produit sain, équitable et pour tous sur vous. Merci. Uh, before I'm do, before you uh, ask, answer the question, if you are asking any other question concerning price, please put the question in the Q, Q and H session. I will not be able to take that except there's another question, vital question. Thank you. Please go ahead and answer the question. Okay, eh, merci, eh, Monsieur Keita. Eh, eh, je vais être bref pour les questions de temps. C'est-à-dire, euh, nous avons eh, les centres d'appel euh, que nous avons, appel au moins une fois par semaine tous les opérateurs. C'est pour eh, recenser ces informations utiles par rapport au prix, au volume et à la prévision des récoltes. Ceci nous donne, et même les intrants utilisés. Donc, on a un compte d'exploitation parce que si on les laisse aux producteurs eux-mêmes, euh, ce n'est pas leur souci principal. Donc, nous avons compris que nous-mêmes devons faire l'effort pour récolter ces informations. Et c'est en guise de tout ça, les 20 à 30 des différences entre les prix conventionnels sont fixés et facilités par l'équipe technique pour qu'il n'y ait pas... Euh, désherbation des prix pour augmenter juste pour mieux vendre parce qu'il faut sauvegarder l'intérêt des producteurs et aussi des consommateurs. Donc, nous, nous sommes au juste milieu. Euh, merci. Je vous remercie, Diawara. Merci, M. Keita. Merci. 
Thank you very much. The last question will be for Benjamin, and that will be our last question today. I am very sorry, uh, our time is fast paid. Benjamin, last question, please. Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Benjamin Dewey, chef in particular. I'm coming from Malawi. And uh, I've liked the presentation that does to say, uh, we as chefs, sometimes we have an integral part in organic farming. So I also like to give uh, an honor hand for never ending food in Malawi, which is playing a vital part. So uh, as I've- Can you go I've straight to the to, question, please? Yes, I've, as, I've as listened to traceability of food. Sometimes farmers, they play an, imp in, an important part in traceability because I have to uh, advise my customers, my clients uh, to say, this recipe has been devised out of uh, food traceability. This is organic food. So to what extent in Malawi, in my country, can I collaborate with never, never ending food as an organization for us to have a clear traceability of food whereby customers have to be very confident that the food that is being brought on my plate is coming from organic food, as I've heard from the presentation. Thank you. Kelly, do you want to answer this for us? Shelly, essay. South Africa, do you want to answer this for us? Are you there? Sorry, um, Cheryl had to leave, so so, um, she's not here anymore. Apologies. So go ahead. You can answer the question, please. Um, it was your question was focused on. Sorry, I I didn't get all of Ability. the questions traceability, how, how, to what extent can he as a chef be able to trust the traceability? For um, through, through your participation, because if you see the whole system working and you go to the farm visit and you are come and eat at the market and you recognize, you know, you will see from the labeling. So from your involvement in the food system, firstly, and secondly, in the PGS activity, that is, you know, we've got to stop we start trusting ourselves as opposed to relying on other people to tell us what to trust. And of course, we can't have every single consumer at a farm visit. But certainly, if you want your, if you want to be involved and you want that assurance, go on the farm visit. I think when Matt was talking about the technology, that ultimately, when farmers have got, they've been approved, their crop lists are down, they list their availability, you'll be able to go on an app and click on that particular farmer and see, oh, the farmer had their visit on this date. The farmer was approved. Here's the certificate. I know that I can trust it because I know it's a PGS system. So the one part is your physical involvement. The second part is this development, the technology that Matt was referring to, which I think will help enormously with that. Hope I've answered the question, sorry. Thank you very, very much. Uh, thank you everyone for joining today. We will not be able to take more questions because of our time. I would like to say a big thank you to all our panelists. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you for giving out. I'm sure we've all enjoyed the webinar today. We've all uh, picked one or two things and we've learned something new today. And hopefully in another two weeks, we'll be having the final webinar. And uh, that has to do with uh, you know collaboration with other stakeholders who are not necessarily PGS. How do we collaborate this all full system because it involves okay. everybody. How do we collaborate? How do we bring everybody together so that we can all work together and achieve the same um, goal? On this note, I would like to say uh, thank you and to end the session and to say a big thank you to G uh, GIZ and say a big thank you to Sasso for making this uh, webinar possible. Thank you very much and uh, see you in the next two weeks. Bye for now. Thank you, Wumi. Thank you, everybody. Bye. 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 Bye, bye Audrey. Bye. Bye. <laughs> I'm going to do bye. Thank bye, you so honey. much. Bye, bye, bye. 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 B
Merci. Merci, merci, merci. Yeah. Fortunate, I saw you. Bye. <laughs> Thank you for always coming. Bye. bye. Mama, bye. bye. Thank you for always coming. Bye. Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye. Well, done. well done. Well done. Evil moderator. Cheers. Yeah. Thank you for the nice